Good morning. Welcome. Glad you are here. It is a great day to worship our Lord. If you are new, we are thrilled that you are here as our guest. Please uh, take the bulletin in the bottom right corner, uh, tear out that perforated part, put your name on there and information, and drop that in the offering plate as our guest this morning. There are a number of different events coming up in the church over the next couple of weeks as we move towards Christmas. Please uh, read through your bulletin. Uh, too many times people say, oh, yeah, I didn't know about that. It's usually right in here. So make a note of what's in the bulletin so that you could be involved in the church in whatever way from children through adults. Uh, excited that you're here. Excited that we could worship, we could celebrate Advent. The move towards Christmas, the, the coming, the waiting that we have. Sometimes it's hard to wait for something, but also when we wait, we are preparing our hearts for something good that's to come, and that's the birth of Christ. Would you pray with me as we prepare to worship? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, we could be in your house, that we could worship you, we could proclaim you, we could wait upon you for the gift of your Son to come into the world, to come into our hearts, our spirits, our minds, our whole being, that we would know you in a new way. Maybe for the first time, maybe once again to renew our covenant with you. And so Lord, help us to have our hearts and our minds, our spirit, our whole being open to you so that we would experience your power, we would experience your grace, we would experience your hope. Thank you, Jesus, for today. We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Today, we're going to focus on hope. Hope that Jesus Christ brings. And we're going to look to the scriptures to remind us of where that hope comes from. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name which will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Today, we're going to light a blue candle and we're going to remind us of God's great gift and a promise to us in his son, Jesus Christ, because he is our hope, he is our redeemer, and he is our Savior. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you the thanks and the praise for sending your Son, Jesus, to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and our hope. Lord, just open our hearts and open our eyes to see that hope, and that your presence may be known, and may, you may dwell in each and every one of us and live within us this season and all the years to come until you return. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Amen. Well, good morning, and please sing with us. Angels, we have heard, uh, heard on high. Here we go. One, two, ready, and... <laughs>
As we turn to the Lord in prayer, please remember the family of Norma Phones. Norma passed away on Friday, and if you would keep her family in your prayers, that would be so much appreciated. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you, for your promise to be with us, not to abandon us, not to run when we're bad, but you promise us you will stay with us. We can't run from you. You always know where we are. You always know what's going on in our lives. There's nothing that surprises you. Nothing catches you off guard. Help us to find comfort in that, to find strength, encouragement, that you are always with us, that you will strengthen us. Father, we pray for Norma's family as they grieve her loss, as we, her family in the church, grieve her loss. Help us to be comforted by the fact that she is with you. Her body, which was broken here, has been restored, renewed with you. She is whole again. And we thank you for that gift. We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling during this time, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, whatever the situation is. Lord, we pray that your presence, your spirit would overwhelm us and we would experience you in ways we never have before. And we would celebrate you. We would be a people of hope because you are a God of hope. Lord, this morning as we take communion, help us even at this moment that we would offer ourselves to you. We would seek your presence, we would seek your forgiveness and we would experience your grace, your grace which never ends. Because you pour your spirit into our hearts because you love us. And so we thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this church, for who we are, who we've even been but for who we are yet to become as we serve you and glorify you. Bless us during the holiday season, Lord, that we would serve you. It wouldn't be about us, but it would be about you and how we serve you and how we serve one another. And we thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you've given to us as we prepare to give an offering. Help us, Lord, that as we give, we give because you have so richly blessed us by sending the Christ child into the world. You have given us hope and peace and joy and love. And those cannot be taken away. So as we give this morning, help us to give hopeful with expectant hearts filled with your grace and your love. We pray in Christ's name, amen.
Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and it's the Sunday that we celebrate hope. Hope is an amazing thing. You know, the people in the first century, even the people before that, really didn't have a whole lot of hope because they didn't know who Jesus was. They were waiting for some future Messiah, someone who was going to come, but who had not yet come. And so when we come to the table this morning, we have hope because we know who Jesus is. We have knowledge of him, but more than the knowledge, we have belief. We have faith. We have trust. Imagine when you don't have hope. What do you have? So as we come to the table, this table really represents our hope. Because Christ came for us. He came into the world and he lived for us and he died for us and he rose again for us so that we could have this amazing hope. Hope not just in the world that we have today, and yet hope that he is with us, never to abandon us, but yet there's hope in the future world. The future is eternity. And that's what this table represents. It represents Christ's body broken for us. So as we partake in communion this morning, if, if, you say, if you've said yes to Jesus and you believe in him, then this table is for you. And so take and eat and take and drink in remembrance of him because he is your hope. And when you have that hope, you will never be disappointed as Paul tells us in Romans 5. You will never be disappointed because God has poured his spirit into your hearts. So you always have the spirit of Christ in you. Ty, would you pray? Dear God, we come to you this morning thanking you for the privilege of coming to your table. We thank you for the honor of remembering your sacrifice, for the sacraments we have here today. Please bless these sacraments that come into our body, and may we know the purpose and the meaning of them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested. He took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Friends, take and eat in remembrance of Christ. Bless this cup in remembrance, in remembrance of the blood that Christ shed on the cross for us. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
After the supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood being poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Friends, take and drink in remembrance of Christ. It feels strange for me to think that the Christmas season has officially begun. According to stores, that day started on November 1st, which is the first day after Halloween. Honestly, I'm not into listening to Christmas music yet. That'll probably hit me on December 23rd. It's the way I am. So as we move into the season, what are you expecting? What are you looking forward to for the Christmas season? Is there anything that you're hopeful about? Well, with that in mind, for the next four weeks, we're going to take a look at Christmas expectations. When Christmas time rolls around, usually we're looking forward to the good things. We're hopeful. We're hopeful there's going to be those magical moments, those family get-togethers, friends coming together. And in some ways, we envision a Norman Rockwell painting, those magical moments, kind of a George Bailey kind of reunion, and it's a wonderful Christmas, a family having fun with the decorations. Then there's the, the family that comes together. You go to the next slide. I didn't do that for you, Tim. The family that comes together and they're all happy to see one another. Dad dressing up as Santa, loving on his wife. That doesn't always happen, does it? Does it always happen that way in your home? I, I don't know. Uh, we end up making a mess of the Christmas tree and we get all frustrated and uh, you look at, you go to the next slide. What amazed me is that's a, a clerk in a store in 1947. That's when that painting was done. I didn't realize it was that bad in 1947. But sometimes that's how we feel when we're out shopping. We become exhausted. The hoped for joy for Christmas becomes filled with disappointment. The kids have a meltdown because the PS4 they were hoping for really was socks and underwear. You have an Uncle Frank who always brings up the bad things in the family, all the past hurts. Aunt Agnes is always angry and, and bitter and makes people uncomfortable. And everyone seems to walk on eggshells because we don't want to upset anyone in the house. You, and so you start to dread Christmas. You dread the get-togethers. And then there's always that gift that I try to avoid that says, Some assembly required. There should be a slide for that too. Those are the ones I dreaded. Now, now, this sounds like this could be a real downer-sounding sermon series. But I hope it's not. Hopefully, you're going to be filled with God's presence and love as we move through the season. And you're going to experience some expectations and see some things that we just haven't seen before in the Bible. Because sometimes there's a gap between our expectations and our reality. Sometimes we experience more of a National Lampoon's Christmas vacation than we do of a real Christmas. Sometimes we wonder where's the hope? Where's the joy? Sometimes we wonder why? Why Christmas? What's it really all about? 
And those are real questions that we can ask at the Christmas season because it's really the cornerstone of Jesus coming into the world. But what we sometimes don't realize is some of these questions were being asked at the very first Christmas. Things didn't necessarily go according to plan for Mary and Joseph. You see those manger scenes, and they're smiling, and they're happy. And I don't know if they were all smiles and happy. Yes, they were thrilled that they brought a child into the world, but I kind of think they were expecting to go to Bethlehem Memorial Hospital. <laughs> Not a barn. That wasn't in their expectations. But it was part of their reality. So what difference does Christmas make? What's the real and true difference that God offers us? And so to start to answer that, I want to look at the story of Mary as she visited her cousin Elizabeth. We see this young teenage girl who's pregnant, who's not married. She's engaged. And yet Mary sings a song called the Magnificat. That's Latin for magnifies, which is how Mary starts this song. And in this passage, Mary shows us a few things. And in the first four verses, listen to what she says. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. Isn't it amazing what Mary is saying? She's an unwed, pregnant teenager with what seems to be a made up, bizarre story. If it was in our day, she'd be on a new TV reality show. And here she is, she's praising God for choosing her. Can you imagine how difficult life had to be for her? And yet this song sounds so real and so authentic. It's like this praising, praising God is coming from deep down in her soul in spite of her circumstances. And she pours out her heart and gives thanks to God. I'm not sure many of us would have felt like Mary did. Mary's a nobody. Go back to that day and age. She's a woman. She's pregnant. And she's not married. It's not what you wanted in those days. People know enough about the birds and the bees that Mary just couldn't say, hey, good news, I'm pregnant. But there was no man involved. We're good. Really? You're going to buy that story? Your teenage daughter comes to you and says that, and you're going to be like, who is he? The story seems far-fetched. Mary was fully aware of her place in the world. Not only was she unwed, engaged, pregnant, she's from Nazareth. Nazareth wasn't the place to be from. So the, it was all going against her. And yet Mary is told by the angel Gabriel that she is going to be the mother of the Son of God. He's the one all the Jewish people have been looking to. He would be the king of kings, a mighty ruler. He would be a warrior. He would be the high priest. And with that in her mind, Mary recognizes that God is doing great things for her, even though she was undeserving of it. Even though she couldn't muster anything to warrant it, she praises God from the depth of her soul. 
She proclaims that God is doing great things for her and that people are going to look at her and call her blessed. And so you see, we see something in Mary that is so important for us to hold on to during this season. But not just in December, but all the time. Jesus coming into the world for Mary was deeply personal. It's kind of obvious. She's giving birth to the Savior. But Christ coming into the world should be personal for us as well. When we think about Christmas, it's not just about the holiday, the season where we get to eat more and party more and maybe become a Scrooge and get away with it, have days off of work. Christmas is personal because it's God sending his son into the world for you. It needs to be personal. It needs to be deeply personal. Can you imagine God the Father sent Jesus into the world just for you? Because you are not some nameless, faceless fluke of creation that others would want you to believe that you are. God sent his son for you. You were created with a purpose. God had you in mind when he created this world. He has big plans for you, whether you believe it or not, he does. When we see and experience Christ, when we personally experience him coming into the world as our redeemer, as our sustainer, we must believe and trust that this is personal. It wasn't just for Mary, but it's for you and I. It's the creator of the universe coming here for us. One way, when we say yes to Jesus, we become God's son. We become God's daughter. It's through faith in the one whom he sent, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. That's God's promise to you and I. And it becomes so personal. It's a gift given to us. And it makes Christmas personal for us. And so join with Mary and give praise to God this Advent season because he's personally extended himself to you in sending Jesus for you. Thank him because he's initiated something that none of us deserve, that none of us have earned. Welcome him in because he's, he's God. He is God. He's not merely some celebrity or some hero. He's come to you through Christ and so magnify him. Say that he's magnificent. Show who he is in the way you live your life. Christmas makes a difference because God has personally extended himself to us in sending Jesus for us. But Mary doesn't stop there. It's a profound place to stop and just drink in who Jesus is. But she doesn't stop there. She continues singing and she moves into something that, that shows global implications in who Christ is. The next thing that Mary says in her song is about the world. She says, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. I don't know if you pick up on it, but Mary is saying something that is so profound. There's a worldview that God had in mind, and Mary picked up on that. Not bad 
for a young teen. God plans to dramatically change the world with the coming of his son. There's all kinds of thoughts and movements in this cosmic drama which are going to play out. There's going to be an extension of God's mercy to those who fear him. And that mercy is found in Jesus. And remember when, when Mary sings, his mercy is for those who fear him. It's not, oh, I'm afraid. It's, it's a, a fear which is about a healthy reverence of who God is. It's, having, it's holding God in awe. It's holding God above everything in life. It's about holy worship of God. And when you have that, Mary says, you receive God's mercy. And not just Mary, but the world has the opportunity to receive that as well. It's also looking at that last verse, which bookends the good news for those who are in Christ. Those who are hungry will be filled when you're spiritually hungry and you seek after God, God will not hide from you. You will find him and you will experience him and you will, you will be filled with the good things in Christ. So with the coming of Christ, God shows his strength in bringing the low and the hungry to be high and to be filled. He extends his mercy to all those who embrace him as Lord and Savior. Yet on the other hand, Mary sings something totally outrageous. It's those middle two verses, verses 51 and 52, where she says, God is going to extend his arms, not just to help the hungry and those who are downtrodden, but how God is going to confront the arrogant, the proud, to those who sit on their thrones. Listen to those words again. She says, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of, a, of humble estate. To these folks, God's strength comes against them to send them away empty-handed. Mary believes that with Christ's coming, God shows his strength in confronting the powerful and self-sufficient rich to overthrow them and empty them. As I was researching this message, I read an interesting fact that this song was banned in the 1980s from being read publicly in Guatemala because it was considered politically subversive. Can you imagine that? This song banned for being politically subversive. And yet it is. Consider what Mary is really saying. But hold on, we, we don't catch it because we live in 2018. Go back to Mary's day. Consider who her audience might have been. What do you think King Herod would have thought of this song? When some of his guys said, hey, did you see these middle verses? What she's saying? This is a guy who was neurotic, who killed people in his family if he thought they were against him. He was crazy. He was scared. He's the guy who, when he heard that some baby was being born in Bethlehem who was going to be a king, called the wise men and said, hey, I want to go worship him. Uh-uh. He wanted to kill the kid. And when he couldn't find him, what did he do? He went out and tried to have all the other two-year-old boys in that area killed. That's the kind of guy he was. So when you read these words, consider who the audience was back then. And what would Caesar Augustus think? My goodness. This was treason. It was grounds for death. And understand this, folks. It was the grounds for the death of your Savior. And Mary was writing about it. 
Now stick with me for one more minute and understand this about her song. Mary does not sing this song in the future tense. What tense is it in? It's in the past tense. She believes not, she believes this is a future reality which is going to happen, that those who are mighty are going to be brought down. She believes in this. She believes in this as a fact. That's outrageous. She wants us to see that what God has declared is as good as done. It's not hopeful dreaming. It's an expectation of God's reality in our world. With Christ's coming, she sings that God's justice has, has begun. In Mary's eyes, this is a foregone conclusion. The humble are going to be lifted up. The hungry are going to be fed. The proud, those on their thrones, they're going to be brought down. The rich are going to be emptied. Why is she so sure of this with Christ coming? Because God sent Jesus so that he would be king of kings and lord of lords. He came as a king who would use his authority to lay down his life on the cross. And in this way, Jesus paid the penalty for our sinfulness. So that God's justice wouldn't come against us. That's why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, For our sake, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The one who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, so that God could look at us and say, Oh, on Michael's own, he's not righteous. He never will be, but because I died for him, he is righteous. That's what Mary saw in the coming of Jesus. It was Christ who would be sacrificed for our sins. We're made righteous before God, and now we can experience his grace and his peace. And in the final two verses, Mary sings, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Mary ends with words of national importance. The Jewish people would hear these words from Mary and they would celebrate. They would know that God will bring mercy to his people Israel. Just as God spoke to their fathers, as he spoke to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, God will also speak to the people of Israel. He would speak to the people of that generation as well. God had always promised the Messiah would be coming. The people held on to these words. They, they were expectant that the Messiah was coming. And yet when he came, they didn't believe it. The birth of Jesus didn't come just at some random time. It was planned out by God. He knew what was happening. He knew how it was going to happen. He knew when. He knew it all. Mary sang for joy about a God who is magnificent. The birth of Jesus wasn't the unlikely fulfillment of a bunch of strange coincidences that some random people wishfully thought of hundreds of years before. Jesus Christ coming was a matter of God fulfilling his long-standing promise to his people. When we experience Christ's coming, it means God is fulfilling his promises. All those promises that God has made to us through Christ, the promise that we would receive forgiveness by receiving Christ, the promise that he would never leave us, that Jesus will never forsake us, the promise of life with God now, with God today, and the promise that God will take our hand someday and lead us into eternity with him. Add to that any promise that God makes, and you can bank on it.
God will keep his word. He cannot break his word. So follow Mary's lead. And praise God during Advent. Because in sending Christ, God has fulfilled his promise to us. You may be looking for that great Norman Rockwell Christmas. And I hope you get it. I hope you do. I hope I get it. But whether we do or we don't, whether we have these lofty Christmas expectations, they shouldn't be diminished if Christmas doesn't go according to plan. If the gift you really want, it doesn't come. It's not a big deal. Because you've already received the best gift. And that's the gift of Jesus. And that, my friends, is worth singing about. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. It's hard to imagine that he would come into the world knowing what was before him. It's hard to imagine knowing the cross would be before him. And yet he did that for us. God fulfilled his promises for us to give us hope so we could be a people of hope, a hope that would never end through Christ. And so, Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus for us. We thank you for sending your spirit to fill us. Help us, Lord, as we move through the season, that we would experience your grace, your power, your mercy, your love, your hope, and that we would pass that on so others could see that Jesus is truly alive. And we would sing a song because of you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we prepare for our final song, if you've heard a word this morning, you say, I need to know Jesus. Maybe there's some part that said, I need to celebrate who he is. I encourage you to come forward and celebrate Jesus. If it's a need for prayer, let's break down the throne room of God. If it's to join this church, let's come together and celebrate who Christ calls you to be. We stand and sing with us, please. Come let us adore him. Thanks for being here this morning that we could worship together. We give him all the glory. Christ gets all the glory for coming into the world for us, to give us hope, to give us life, to give us eternity. Go this week into the world. Show the world who he is with whatever you do. Celebrate Jesus.